Hi, welcome to this webinar on fingerspelling and literacy for deaf and hard of hearing students. I'm Brenda Schick from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Funding for this project was provided by the U.S. Department of Education by the Office of Special Education Programs. And this work is licensed under a Creative Commons International license. I'm the co-principal investigator for the Center on Literacy and Deafness. I'm also a former teacher of the deaf. I'm a CODA. I grew up in a deaf family. And I'm interested in both spoken and sign language development in deaf and hard of hearing children. And CLAD is a national research and development center. So today's goals are to provide you with an overview of fingerspelling development, to show the relationship between fingerspelling skills and reading skills in deaf and hard of hearing children, and show that fingerspelling may be a possible route to decoding skills. And this is probably the most important part of this talk today. So fingerspelling in ASL is a very important part of the lexicon in, in both ASL and in simultaneous communication. I sometimes encounter teachers and interpreters who have the misconception that SIMCOM should minimize fingerspelling, but that's simply not true. Fingerspelling is also common in deaf signers. Research has shown that adults fingerspell about 12 to 35 percent of what they sign. And fingerspell is, spelling is in our earliest movies of ASL. There's also many English words that must be fingerspelled. There are no signs for words like leopard, chess, saddle, things like that. Linguists recognize that fingerspelling is a phonological system. We often think about ASL phonology, the phonology of ASL signs, but the phonology of signs is not exactly the same as the phonology of fingerspelling, but linguists are finding some interesting overlaps. There are different kinds of fingerspelling. Many of you probably already know about lexicalized fingerspelling, where the fingerspelled word does not represent each letter in many times. So we have lexicalized back, car, dog, which are look more sign-like. We also have fluent neutral fingerspelling. That fluent neutral fingerspelling is not just a sequence of letters. That in good fluent neutral fingerspelling, you can see sublexical units. You can see chunking and coarticulation. So when I sign mat, sat, fat, cat, you can see that my AT in those fingerspelled words had a very similar type of production, movement, and coarticulation. We're going to see a young boy fingerspell motorcycle and education, and you will see him chunking these words into smaller parts. It's important to note that neutral fingerspelled words can become lexicalized quite rapidly during a single discourse. In terms of development of fingerspelling, many deaf parents fingerspell to their young babies, even after birth. They know that their babies can't understand fingerspelling, much like we know that babies can't understand talking to them, but we do it anyway because eventually they will pick it up. And indeed, deaf children with deaf parents um, often fingerspell at a very young age. But it's not really a fingerspelled word. It's sort of a big word. It's not just individual letters. And the cognitive representation is probably at the word level as well. And movement envelopes are very salient to them. So I had observed a 24-month-old deaf child with deaf parents who signed the word juice like this, the word pizza like this, Okay. So there was salient movement envelopes there as well, many missing letters, but it still functioned as a lexical item for her. Around four years of age, a deaf child with deaf parents sometimes begins to focus on the individual letters. They begin to notice that there's word internal parts to these fingerspelled words. And if parents have taught them, many can match hand shape to printed letters. Now, not all deaf parents encourage this type of activity, so it's one thing that we should always encourage even deaf parents to do with their children. Um, you'll still see many articulation and hand shape errors, which is typical development, just like it is with hearing children in spoken language. Let's look at a movie of Todd. He's a four-year-old deaf child of deaf parents, and his parents are 
use a lot of finger spelling, and this is his lexicalized version of dog. So that word is already in his vocabulary. But this next word, the teacher is going to ask him to fingerspell duck, and watch how he uses print to scaffold his fingerspelling. So he signs duck, she asks him to fingerspell it, he sort of shakes his head and points to the printed word, he can pick the printed word out, he spells D-U, looks at the print, C-K. And so he already has a very strong connection between print and fingerspelling. This is Connor, his older brother, and he's in a special fingerspelling intervention that we have that I'll be describing later where he's learning big words like this. And watch how he fingerspells motorcycle, and you'll be able to see some of those chunks I was talking about. Okay, that is true fluent neutral fingerspelling. Now this next word, education, he's struggling a little bit with this to, uh, to recall how to fingerspell this word. But what, watch how he sort of retrieves the word in these chunks. E-D-U-C-A T-I-O-N and notice that last T-I-O-N, how much, how co-articulated, how much it appeared as a single unit. He clearly has these, this word represented in his cognitive system. His f mental phonological representation of this word includes the chunks as well. So fingerspelling is an essential part of sign language, and we have to believe that young children can learn to fingerspell. But one thing we know, and we're getting more and more data on it, is that hearing teachers and parents often do not fingerspell to their young children. So why do you think that's the case? Why don't you take a few minutes to discuss that and pause the video, and when you're ready to see my thoughts on this, then restart the video. Okay, some of my top reasons is, my top reason is that Many people think that fingerspelling is a skill you learn when you learn to read, that you don't fingerspell until a child can, can read, because they associate fingerspelling as an English orthographic issue rather than a linguistic part of the language issue. So that's one reason, I think. Um, fingerspelling can be hard for hearing people. For those of you who have had to learn to sign as an adult, you know that fingerspelling is a very challenging skill to master and it's easy to avoid. Um, I think that many people also don't understand that fingerspelling can be at a word level. In fact, that's where children probably should really start to get them to have some word level lexicalized fingerspelled signs in their vocabulary to start them out on fingerspelling young. And many teachers, I think, believe that it is better to invent a sign, that fingerspelling is just too challenging for children, it's better for you to have a sign instead. So let's switch our attention to fingerspelling and reading. Let's, let's start talking about this big idea of how fingerspelling could serve as a possible alternative pathway to decoding words and strengthening print recognition. So. We know that many of our deaf and hard of hearing children have limited sound access and limited decoding skills. That even with the current hearing technologies, there are still many deaf and hard of hearing children who have limited functional access to sound. That is, that they really don't understand speech through hearing. And so many of these children use sign language either as a supplement or as an alternative to spoken language. And teaching decoding skills using spoken phonological awareness when you have limited sound access is a very big challenge. So here's the phonological problem of decoding print. With spoken English, children have a spoken phonological representation of that word in their cognitive system, and the teacher's job is to teach them the complex mapping, 
using the alphabetic principle and teaching decoding skills of how to get from what they know the word sounds like and sa uh, how you say it to mapping it onto English orthography. And that is one of the first most important stages of hearing children learning to read. But when children are using sign language, and it doesn't matter whether it's CINCOM or ASL, the phonological representation of a sign has no relationship with English orthography. We can talk about the phonology of a sign like mom, but there is no relationship between this phonology and what the child sees in print. So it becomes, instead of decoding English orthography, it becomes a big task of memorizing English orthography, which we know is not a very effective way. Fingerspelling, however, has a one-to-one -one relationship with English orthography. It maps on to English orthography even better than spoken language does. And so we can take advantage of that fact. So fingerspelling may serve as an alternative to spoken phonological awareness and phon phonics. It may provide a child with a visual and kinesthetic way to analyze written words into smaller parts and to store them in their brains. And so it is a different form of decoding, but it is a form of decoding. And so then deaf and hard of hearing children would not need to rely on sight word memorization, which we know is a very ineffective way for all children to learn to read. So here's our model of fingerspelling as a connection to print, that for any child, hearing or deaf, they have a mental lexicon. And for deaf children, that means that they have signs stored in their cognitive system. They have lexicalized fingerspelling stored in their cognitive system. And some have spoken words as well. So as I'll be talking a little bit more later, we believe that when we get children to do physical fingerspelling word analysis, where we're having them fingerspell words and break them down into parts, that leads to stronger mental fingerspelling phonological representations and probably earlier uh, establishments of those representations. And when they link them with a mental orthographic representation, that leads to orthographic knowledge. It leads to sublexical knowledge. We could see that, that Connor in his finger, fingerspelling of education clearly had sublexical knowledge of that word and that T-I-O-N chunk was a pattern to him. Um, and leads, we believe it will lead to better word identification of print. So let's talk about this mental fingerspelling phonological representation. We, we came up with this term and for a hearing children, when we talk about what's actually in their cognitive representation of spoken phonemes, it's incl it includes how they sound, how you say them, how your muscles and vocalizations are coordinated to produce them. And even for hearing children, there's research that shows that there's lip reading in there as well. So how do you guys think that fingerspelling is stored in our cognitive system? So once again, pause the video, and when you're ready, come back and see how yours compares with mine. Okay, I think that up there is what the fingerspelling spelled word looks like when somebody else spells it and when I see my own hand spell it. I think that it also stored up there is what it feels like on their hand. I don't know if any of you have ever observed a child when they're trying to read a word. We see kids sometimes spelling it out and then they recognize the word. It's almost like invoking that kinesthetic motor pattern helps them recall that word a little bit better. I think that stored up there are chunks that are common patterns, like the AT or the T-I-O-N are common patterns. And I think that children also have stored how fingerspelling relates to print. I'm, I'm sure that many of you came up with some different things, probably ones that I would love to know, so perhaps you could even email me uh, those ideas. Okay, so let's move to a national study of fingerspelling skills. How well do our deaf and hard of hearing students fingerspell? Uh, that's a big question that we don't know the answer to. So working with a, 
a student, uh, I developed a test on fingerspelling ability and phonological awareness test. This, this is modeled after many common tests of spoken language phonological awareness. And the test consists of five subtests. There's an imitation task where children have to imitate words of increasing length, which is really a phonological memory task. There's an alliteration task where it has the same first sound or the same first letter. Uh, we have a rhyming task where the children have to find which words have the same last chunk. And we have a blending task that I'll show you an example, and an elision task where you have a word like flight and remove the L, what's left. So here is the Elysian task, T-I-M-E, that M, take it out, what's left? And what's left is tie. And that is, requires a lot of phonological uh, memory span to do this task. Here's the blending task. Oh, I guess we're not seeing that. Okay, so we collected data using this test from 161 kids from kindergarten to fifth grade from schools all across the United States and one Canadian province and uh, combined data from three different studies. So we gave children the fingerspelling test, the expressive one word picture vocabulary test, the Woodcock Johnson letter word identification and a PIAT passage comprehension task. In terms of demographic data for children between kindergarten to about third grade, roughly our data set is about 20% in each of those grades. We have fewer kids in fourth and fifth grade. 30% of these kids have a deaf mom or dad or both, and that's a pretty high number, we know. 40% of these kids use spoken English at home, about 40% use ASL, 14% use Spanish, and uh, only 22% use speech and sign. So here are the results of the test. This is percent correct on all of those different subtests. And along the top, you can see the results for words, for alliteration, and for rhyming. And you can see those cling together pretty tightly. So, you know, imitation alone tells us a lot about what a child can do. And you can see that kindergartners get a roughly around 60% correct, and it goes up to around 90% correct by fifth grade. But elision and blending are much harder tasks, and they are also clinging together, that kindergartners very rarely are able to get uh, more than 10% of the items correct, and it only goes up to about 70% in fifth grade. Now, remember, None of these children in this particular study have ever been in a program that taught them fingerspelling explicitly, that most of them learned their, how to do blending in the legion just because they know how to do fingerspelling. That's not a task that is used in school. There's a significant main effect for grade here, which means that as kids get older, they get better now. Um, so interesting data. So how does fingerspell spelling correlate to reading in this particular group? Is there a relationship between reading skills and fingerspelling skills? So here are the correlations between fingerspelling skills, reading, and, and vocabulary skills. And let, let me just walk you through this, that when you look at age and fingerspelling, there's a correlation of 0.62, which is a pretty, pretty moderate correlation. When you look at fingerspelling and expressive vocabulary, there's a correlation of 0 0.5, 5.1, moderate. When you look at fingerspelling and reading, there's a correlation of 0.85, a very strong correlation. And in fact, you would expect a correlation between age and expressive vocabulary, but there isn't one, not a significant correlation. And there's no significant correlation between reading and expressive vocabulary, um, although in there is in many research studies. And one of the reasons is that the fingerspelling effect is so strong, it wipes out the effect of age on reading and expressive vocabulary on reading. So we know that fingerspelling skills are significantly related to both reading and vocabulary after controlling for age. So let's do another mini discussion. How are children taught fingerspelling? 
um, I want you to think about how they learn it. What, how do people teach it? And so you'll pause the video, and when you're ready to come back, um, you'll see some of my ideas on this. Okay, how are children taught fingerspelling? Well, one major way is through daily exposure, that many teachers and parents fingerspell to their children and use it as an active part of the language. And there are also lots of commonly fingerspelled words we see with, that are used with young children, such as yes, what, early, do, do, no, many words that young children see very early in life. There's also many words that happen in classrooms that have no sign. So, uh, you know, the word hoof, fungus, hexagon, stirrup. Uh, in a sixth grade science lesson, there are words like nucleus, cytoplasm, cell membrane, oxygen, things like that. So children may be exposed through fingerspelling through a teacher or parent fingerspelling some of these words. So through exposure at school or home, a word comes up that needs to be fingerspelled. Uh, we have a study in progress with one of my doctoral students, Marsha Walsh. She's looking at how much do teachers actually fingerspell in the classroom. And as you might guess, there's quite a big range. There, our preliminary data shows that the teacher who fingerspelled the least fingerspelled 32 words in 40 minutes worth of lessons. That's less than one fingerspelled word per minute. The highest used 119 fingerspelled words in 40 minutes, which is roughly around three per minute. And the average was less than two fingerspelled words per minute. And what we're also finding is that teachers in total communication programs tend to use even less fingerspelling than that. So kids really don't get exposed to a whole lot of fingerspelling. Um, in fact, I'll show you some, some uh, oh, another way that children are taught fingerspelling is by connecting fingerspelling with classifiers and general signs. One of the things we know from the research literature that particularly deaf teachers and many hearing teachers connect signs, print, and fingerspelling. And one technique that's commonly called chaining is where the teacher might print to the printed word, point to the printed word forest, and then sign forest, and then fingerspell forest, and then sign forest again. So the teacher is creating a chain between the print, the sign, and the fingerspelling. Another common technique that we see used, even with very young children, is often called sandwiching, where you'll see a sign, then the fingerspelling of that sign, and then the sign. So sign poem, fingerspell poem, sign poem. And so that probably is a very effective technique, although we don't have very much data on it, in helping children connect a ASL sign with an English representation of that word using fingerspelling. So here's an example of a generic sign that really doesn't mean exactly what the target word is, mild. The target word is mild. So this deaf adult, I'll show you how he signs this and translate it. In Africa, the weather is mild. Okay, and so the sign he used, quiet, there's a lot of different ways that mild could be uh, signed, and so he followed it up with a fingerspelling of the word. Similarly, in this clip, um, he uses a in two English words that really don't have a great sign equivalent. We rode around in a Jeep and looked at the different wild animals. I'm sorry that the video didn't work so well. So let's talk about tips about fingerspelling in our classrooms. It's really, really important. And how can we get more of it in there? So let's talk about general signs versus specific 
finger spelling. That what we see, what we've seen in our classroom observations, and I also do research on interpreters, so I've seen this interpreters also, is that teachers and interpreters often underuse finger spelling. They might use generic or general signs that really don't represent specific English vocabulary, or sometimes I often see key concepts omitted because they require finger spelling and it's easier just to drop it. So here are some great examples of some missed finger spelling opportunities. I had the opportunity to observe in the past a classroom educational interpreter. Uh, I observed her in the fourth grade where the teacher was using the word props again and again and the interpreter interpreted as things. You know, you'll need to bring your things to class. We'll change into your things before the play. And costume turned into clothes um, instead of being the more specific costume. And in a different discussion, in a seventh grade discussion of Ebola medical procedures, the teacher's use of decontamination suit turned into clean clothes. Infectious turned into sick. Ventilator turned into breathe. And overpopulation turned into deleted. So in both of these classrooms, the hearing children were exposed to more sophisticated vocabulary that obviously the teacher expected them to learn and understand, but the deaf student got no exposure to what those words really were. There's also a myth, I think, out there. I hear it a lot from both interpreters and, and sometimes teachers, is that you really only need to fingerspell a word the very first time. It's sort of a rule. You fingerspell a new word the first time it's used, and then you can use a generic time, a sign. And so um, you might fingerspell the word running total once, and then just use a generic sign for add. Um, and in this recent classroom observation of the interpreter, the teacher did actually use the word running total about 15, 15 times, and it was very apparent to me that it was a word she wanted them to use because she almost never substituted a pronoun for it. She didn't say, you need to calculate it. She said, you need to calculate your running total. You need to make sure your running total is in the right-hand column. And she continually used that word again and again. And the deaf student in this case had a single exposure to the word, and ironically, it was at the very end, the interpreter just used add, 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 and finally, at the very, almost the very last time the teacher used it, finally fingerspelled running total. And I've had other people tell me that, well, I fingerspelled that word last week when I introduced it, so I can just use this generic sign a week later. And the chances are very high that if a hearing children cannot learn a new vocabulary item from a single exposure some time ago, a deaf and hard of hearing child won't either. So it's my belief that this is not a good rule. So I also really believe that new vocabulary should be fingerspelled using neutral vocabulary, nice, clean, clear voc fingerspelling, not lexicalized fingerspelling. We have some preliminary data that lexicalized fingerspelling is actually used more frequently during vocabulary instruction, and that neutral is used during instruction. And in my mind, when you're introducing new vocabulary, that's when you really want to fingerspell this word often and have the children fingerspell the word often so that they get that motoric use of this fingerspelling as well, the kinesthetic, they get to see it from their their side of the hand. It's just as important for them to use that neutral finger spelling as it is for the teacher. So I guess following up on that, you need to spell words clearly. Don't lexicalize all finger spelling. Um, lexicalized finger spelling permits deletion of letters and movement patterns that children need to see, that neutral, fluent finger spelling. And many children spell all words as if they are lexicalized, and we need to help them pay attention to all the letters in the words. They need to learn to spell those words using ch proper chunking and getting that uh, correct mental phonological representation. Another thing I've seen in classrooms that 
we should expect children to see the whole finger spelled words. That when a child asks how a word is spelled, the teacher needs to spell the, either the entire word or as big of chunks as she or he thinks that the child can handle. That the child needs to be able to hold that finger spelling in their phonological memory in order to be able to later to write it or to read it. Um, that we have to help increase that length of their phonological memory. And this is a developmental process that requires learning. So it could be with young children, you finger spell it to the child in chunks, or that you finger spell the whole thing, let the child get as much as possible, go back and finger spell it again, let the child get as much as possible. But probably the worst thing to do is to spell one letter, let the child look at it, write it down, spell the next letter, let the child look at it, write it down. That is not helping the child learn the word. It is helping the child learn to, I know what printed letter goes with that hand shape. So you need to expect children to see that whole word. In our data, children can imitate the word caterpillar at about fourth or fifth grade. I guess one of my big questions, or our team's big question, is can we lower that age? Can we strengthen a student's phonological memory so that they can do that at a younger age? Can we work at helping students retain whole words and longer chunks? So ways that we can incorporate fingerspelling is use it early in development and often, uh, use it in preschool, help parents realize that they can expect their children to learn uh, fingerspelled words, not a huge number, but certainly they can learn some fingerspelled words. You, you can use fingerspelling when reading and making connections to print. So it's that whole chaining notion of creating a connection between print the sign and fingerspell. We should always fingerspell names, restaurant names, names of games, toys. Uh, Todd, that four-year-old you saw, already had the fingerspelled version of Lego in his vocabulary. And we have seen children where they don't even know how to fingerspell the names of their siblings. They have invented signs for, when you ask them what their favorite restaurant is, they have an invented sign for Taco Bell. Um, things like that. And so we want to encourage people to fingerspell words instead of inventing signs or using generic signs. And certainly those technical terms really need to be fingerspelled and often. So the question I mentioned before is can we leverage fingerspelling as a pathway to help decoding and print recognition? We know that eighth graders need to recognize more than 10,000 words. That's a lot of words that our day deaf and hard of hearing kids need to learn. So right now we're engaged, we just finished the first year trial of a fingerspelling intervention where we taught children in kindergarten, first and second grade. We had 14 kids in this study, three days a week, about 75 minutes per week. And we taught them in a very, very different kind of way that I'm gonna show you, that we used word families. And one of our overarching goals was that the students would develop mental fingerspelling, phonological representations, like you saw Connor had with education, and mental orthographic representations that will help children do print recognition uh, better. So here's what the word family approach looks like. Kindergartners only got five words, and they only had one family, word family. This is the ET family. First graders and second graders had two word families, the second graders sometimes had three, um, and the first graders had eight words and the second graders had ten words. And we would do a lot of phonological awareness tasks in fingerspelling. So for example, we would, after the, we taught the child how to fingerspell some words, we would play games with them like odd one out, where the child would see the picture that represented put pin and get, and there was no print there, we do this all through fingerspelling alone, have the child fingerspell these words and then ask the child which pictures start with the same first letter. Same thing with an alliteration task where we would show the child uh, the picture word for pet, put, and get, and then ask the child which one, which of those two words, put and get, starts with the same 
first letter as pet. And again, they don't have any print there. We want them to develop this phonological awareness and fingerspelling before we expose them to print. Oh, I'm sorry, this slide was repeated. So here are some of the results. Um, this is data for fingerspelling skills uh, at pretest or baseline and post-test for nine units of these fingerspelled words. And we have two different graphs right here. On the left, we have what we're calling good readers, children who scored on the Woodcock-Johnson at a standard score of 85 or above. And on the right-hand side, we have the scores for the children who we call struggling readers who scored on the Woodcock-Johnson at a standard score of 85 or below. And luckily, we had seven in each group. And you can see that for the good readers, their pretest scores are not very good. They didn't know how to fingerspell these words. But they could, after teaching, and they could also, by the end of, the, by units eight and nine, really by unit seven, they were at ceiling. They got 100% on, on many of these words. In contrast, you can see that for the struggling readers, this, in the beginning particularly, was a very hard task for them, that they were scoring around 50% correct for the first three units. And look at those error bars. Look at the standard deviations. There's large variability in this group. But as you see, this program was actually very effective for these kids because by units seven, eight, and nine, they were scoring 80 and 90% correct, and some of them were scoring 100% correct. And look at those standard deviations. Look at the variations. That There was a lot of variability in the beginning, and by the end, there was much less variability. So this, this kind of approach particularly seems to help those children who are struggling readers. These are the results for print recognition. So at the end of the unit, could they recognize the printed version of this word? And you can see for the good readers on the left, for the most part, they could. And in fact, notice that the print recognition is even a little bit better than being able to fingerspell a word. And that's because for all of us, we recognize more words from print than we're able to actually spell. And that's why spell check's so wonderful. Um, for the struggling readers, we saw the same thing as we saw with fingerspelling, is that in the beginning, it was very challenging for them. They got about 40% correct um, and lots of variability. But by units 7, 8, and 9, they were recognizing 80 to 90% of these words. They were performing nearly as good as the kids who are good readers. So this is pretty remarkable data. These are also interesting data. Remember those data I showed you from that national sample, from the kindergarten to fifth grade national sample? Well, the bar in this represents that national sample. And all of the error bars represent one standard deviation of that na national sample. And what we did is we gave this test to all of our intervention kids. And these are their imitation scores at pretest. And the, each dot represents a single child. Um, and you can see a lot of these kids are not doing very well compared to the national average. We have many dots that are actually low, way near uh, minus one standard deviation, and many kids who are below one standard deviation. But then you look at their results compared to the national sample at post-test after they've gone through this year-long uh, national, uh, year-long intervention. And to me, the results are pretty amazing, that every single kid is scoring very near or above the national sample. And look at the little brown dot for the one child we have in third grade who was actually not in a, in a she was in a first grade version of this intervention. And you can see she moved from being more than one standard deviation below the national sample to being right on average. Um, and so these are pretty remarkable data showing that we did actually improve these kids compared to the national sample. This slide shows examples from one single child on imitation of fingerspelling in that uh, test I just showed you. And this was his responses in the fall and then the spring, one year after he had been in the supplemental fingerspelling program. And you can see in the fall he knew how to fingerspell dog. Foot, he didn't, but 
spelled it T-E-T-E. Sock was T-B-I, which isn't it doesn't even resemble an allowable English word. Fish was I-G-F-G, which is also not an allowable word. However, if you look at his spring responses, he still knows the word dog. He got foot wrong, but notice that the error he made was not imitating the T, but instead the S, two very close hand shapes. And his imitation of the word sock wasn't correct, but notice that it also is an allowable English uh, form. Same thing with fish. He only got the vowel wrong. Instead of an I, it was an E. And all of his words in spring were allowable English responses or allowable English uh, phonotactic patterns. So we believe that teaching fingerspelling and a word family approach is successful, that having children examine and analyze word internal structure of both fingerspelled words and printed words allows them to develop patterns in their mind, chunks in their mind, uh, allowable patterns in their mind that allows them then to recognize new words, uh, recognize these new words in print. And the motivation seems to be high as well, which we're really pleased about. So fingerspelling may be a great literacy tool, that it may provide a phonological representation of English print that, for many uh, good reasons, is a one-to-one -one representation of English orthography. So it may allow children to decode words into a form that links to the mental orthographic representation. So what they have now is the phonological fingerspelling representation, mental fingerspelling phonological representation, the orthographic representation, and the printed word. Um, it, fingerspelling has a strong relationship to reading and vocabulary, and it may provide an alternative to spoken phonological decoding for those of our children who have limited access to sound, who have been particularly hard to teach decoding skills. I want to acknowledge that no project like this is a single individual, that I've had a lot of help from my team at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I've had a lot of help from the team at Georgia State University as well, and I appreciate all the help they've given me. This project, parts of this project were funded by three different federal grants that I want to acknowledge, and here are some references for you. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this webinar. I hope it was informative. I'm looking forward to your questions and to a discussion and hearing what you have learned about fingerspelling with your children and maybe some of the strategies you use to build fingerspelling into your day-long educational process. Thank you very much.